Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first bilingual mayoral debate with the Hartford City Hall candidates for mayor. I am Tiffany Young, and it's a pleasure to be your host tonight running this program in English. And with me is the amazing Kathy Montano, who will run it in Spanish. Gracias, Tiffany. Muy buenas noches a todos. Gracias por estar aquí. Es un gusto y un honor eh, estar aquí participando con ustedes de este gran debate. Es el primer debate bilingüe traído a ustedes por Quad Connecticut. Quad City, que es Women's at the Table, una organización sin fines de lucro trabajando por el desarrollo integral de la mujer en Hartford y en todo el estado. Remember that this debate is brought to you by Quad Connecticut. Women at the Table CT, an organization that is advocating for the local women's empowerment. Moms, daughters, entrepreneurs, immigrants, all women living here in Hartford and statewide. Todas estas mujeres y la ciudad completa quiere escuchar de los candidatos cuáles son sus propuestas para mejorar la ciudad de Hartford. That's right. The outcome of the mayoral election will shape the future of our city. And it's crucial that we make informed decisions. Though this debate, through this debate, we aim to provide a platform for candidates to express their views and proposals so voters can make an educated choice. Así es. Y bueno, ¿qué tal si empezamos a presentar a nuestros candidatos? Before we begin, please note that we do have Spanish translation available. Please visit the table in the rear if you are interested, and it'll go right into your headset. Primero queremos informarles que tenemos a William Newton en la parte de atrás, quien tiene la posibilidad de traducir al español si usted no es, ese no es su primer idioma en inglés. Let's introduce our esteemed mayoral candidates. Joining us today are... Arunen Arulampole. He is the CEO of Hartford Land Bank and previously has served as a Deputy Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection and as a lawyer in a Hartford downtown law firm. Arunen Arulampole is the CEO of Hartford Land Bank and previously has been the Vice Commissioner of the Department of Protection of Consumer of Connecticut and a lawyer in a firm of Hartford. Eric Coleman, a former judge, state representative from 1983 to 1994, and as a state senator representing the second senatorial district, which includes Hartford, Bloomfield, and Windsor, from 1995 to 2017. Eric Coleman, ex juez representante estatal de 1983 a 1994, y senador estatal representando al distrito senatorial 2 que incluye Hartford, Bloomfield y Windsor desde 1995 al 2017. Giselle Jacobs is a United States Army veteran, lead inspector and a business owner in the construction and cleaning industry. She also founded a nonprofit named Children of Color and recently obtained her real estate license. Giselle Jacobs is veterana de los Estados Unidos dueña de negocio en el campo de la limpieza y construcción. También ha fundado Children of Color y recientemente ha obtenido su licencia en bienes raíces. John Van Fora is the state senator representing the first Ontario district, currently serving his 13th term in the Senate, in the state Senate. He holds positions on several committees, including the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee, where he serves as the chair. Van Faro is also a Harvard Public Schools graduate. John Van Fara, senador estatal del primer distrito senatorial, actualmente es su décimo tercer término. Es parte de muchos comités en la legislatura, incluido el de finanzas, ingresos y bonos, donde sirve como presidente. John Van Fara también es graduado de las escuelas públicas de Harvard. Nick LeBron. Nick obtained an associate degree in social work from Capital Community College and a BA in psychology and public policy from Trinity College. He was elected as a Hartford Councilman in 2019, where he currently serves. Nick is also a Hartford Public Schools graduate. Nick Lebron. Nick tiene una licenciatura en trabajo social del Capital Community College. 
y un BA en Psicología y Política Pública del Trinity College. Fue elegido concejal de Humphrey en el 2019 hasta la actualidad y también es graduado de las Escuelas Públicas de Humphrey. Bernardo Dunn, pastor, apostle and founder of the Faith and Miracles International Ministries. Bernardo Dunn, pastor, apóstol y fundador de los Ministerios Internacionales Faith and Miracles. Stan McCauley, videographer and producer. He served as executive director of Hartford Public Access Television and also founded Life Source Production and ACCESTV.org, currently serving as the president of the Greater Hartford African American Alliance. Stan McCauley, videógrafo y productor, fue director de Hartford Public Access Television y ha fundado Light Source Production y AccessTV.org. Actualmente es el presidente de la Alianza Afroamericana de Hartford. Tracy Funny, a longtime resident of Hartford, is a community activist devoted to the North End community, but also seeking to promote unity throughout the entire city. Ms. Funny is currently running late, but will be joining us later. Tracy Fanny, residente de Hartford, es una activista comunitaria devota a la comunidad del norte de Hartford, pero promoviendo unidad para toda la comunidad. Está un poco retrasada, pero pronto estará con nosotros. Ahora vamos con las reglas del juego. Cada candidato tendrá tres minutos para contestar la pregunta de este debate. La pregunta será... Every, I'm sorry. ¿Qué hará en sus primeros 100 días como alcalde de Hartford? Every candidate is going to have three minutes to answer the main question today. What will you do in your first 100 days as mayor of Hartford? Please be respectful of the time. If you pass your time, we don't want to cut you off. So please have your answers within three minutes. We'll start with Mr. Arun Pavan and question. Thank you guys for being here. and Thank you to Watt for putting this on. Um, my name is Arun and it's, it's great to be with you. Uh, I, you know, I, I think this is a great question to start with because the next mayor of the city of Hartford really has to carry the energy of this city and, and the enthusiasm and be ready to hit the ground running on day one. And so th to me, that means a number of very specific um, changes to make City Hall work better for our residents day by day, and, and also laying out a large scale vision. And, and, and from the very get go, putting forth a vision that all of Hartford can get behind. And that vision for me starts with real investment in communities and neighborhoods. I live in this neighborhood. In fact, I got to walk here to this debate, which is really nice. Um, it's, it's about a five minute walk. This is our neighborhood branch library and I've got two of my five kids here. They, 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 they love this place and Graciela and Nancy are, I'm, I'm biased, but probably two of the best librarians in the state. Um, but as I walked out of my home, which is the only single family home on its street in a neighborhood with a 7% home ownership rate, every single time I walk out of my home, it's hard to ignore the fact that 93% of residents in this neighborhood are not able to build wealth in the place in which they live. And, and you know, you walk down to Park Street, which has for, for so many decades in, in, in historically been a center of commerce and, and for a long time was a center of Latino culture and heritage and history and business. And right now, 40% of the businesses on Park Street, where I spend a lot of my time, are shuttered, are closed. Only 60% of those businesses are open. And of those businesses, way too many of them are vape shops and cell phone stores and we need to be able to rebuild small businesses. And, and obviously you don't do that overnight. You don't do that in 100 days. But what we can do in the first 100 days is create a capital fund to, to allow Hartford residents to tap into, to start businesses and become homeowners in our neighborhood. Because the residents of communities like this have all the tools and the talent to be the source of the revitalization of this community and communities in the North End, communities across the city of Hartford, but lack access to capital. And, and, and an ability to, to, to be able to turn that into action. So we're not, we're not gonna turn that around in 100 days, but we're gonna create a capital fund that, that it becomes the building blocks for that revitalization. Um, second, you know, the second piece of my vision is, is real investment in our kids, creating safe spaces for our kids. And just a few days ago, we saw in another horrific act of gun violence, a 17-year-old uh, student, Buckley, who uh, was murdered. Look, 
kids after the school day ends at 3.30 and all summer long, too many kids in the city have nowhere to go. And so before the first summer of violence hits in this city in 2024, I wanted to find the funds to, create a, to, to keep a school open in every single neighborhood, a place that's a safe place for kids to go where they can engage in real parks and, rec, and sports and rec and um, in, in, in music and arts education, have, have adults in their life that are mentoring them and feeding into them, but also a place where parents feel safe to drop off their kids, where they can be kids again. So uh, you know, those are big vision items. We've also got to do a lot of things to hit the ground running uh, within City Hall. Um, they are smaller items. We have almost 200 vacancies within City Hall that need to be filled. Um, and you need a manager to do that. I, I've, I have a real executive experience having worked at a state agency and, and overseeing a workforce of, of over 200 employees. Um, Okay. <laughs> well, I've got a lot more, but I, you know, I hope I hope you get that. You know, you need you need a, a mayor who's ready to hit the ground running and has a lot of ideas. Good evening, everyone, and thank you to Watt for conducting this forum and giving the candidates an opportunity to present themselves and their vision and their plans uh, to you. Uh, during the first 100 days. Uh, the first act that I would perform would be to request the resignation of all of the department heads uh, currently working in the city government. Uh, whether or not those uh, resignations would be accepted uh, will depend on the conversations that I have uh, within those first 100 days with these department heads. Secondly, the centerpiece of my economic development plan has to do with uh, reducing electric bills. Uh, and that is based upon uh, a plan to have Hartford become a utility company itself. And that would be based upon uh, fuel cells and the energy that is produced by fuel cells. So uh, what I would endeavor to do is to uh, pull together a work group of subject matter experts and other stakeholders, including uh, residents of the city of Hartford, uh, to determine uh, the feasibility of pursuing such a plan, as well as uh, the best strategy for implementing that, that plan. Thirdly, uh, as uh, many of you know, the mayor is responsible uh, for appointing five members to the Hartford Board of Education. The charter limits the authority uh, of the mayor in other respects regarding the public schools in Hartford, but uh, the mayor does have the opportunity and the authorization to appoint five members to the board. And before I would exercise that authority, I would seek uh, to put in place a vehicle so that all of the residents and other stakeholders, including teachers uh, and parents, would have some input concerning uh, prospective appointees uh, to this board. Uh, fourthly, uh, many of you have experienced flooding. Uh, and if you haven't experienced, you probably have read about flooding that has occurred in the city of Hartford, or you know someone who's been the victim of flooding. Uh, there is uh, some plan in place coming from the state level uh, to address this flooding. I would put in place uh, during the first 100 days uh, a group to monitor uh, the activities that are included in the bill uh, that was passed in order to uh, monitor not just uh, the damage incurred by residents uh, who were victims of flooding, uh, but also to address what needs to be done in order to correct the condition that's causing that flooding. Good evening, everyone. Um, what an honor it is to be here this evening. I would first like to take this opportunity to thank women at the table for allowing me to be here this evening and for that wonderful introduction. I think that was the most in-depth introduction of Giselle Gigi Jacobs I've heard since being in one of these debates. 
Unfortunately, I, had, I didn't receive the invitation, so I'm grateful for the community member who told me about it, right? Because we too are on Park Street quite often, quite often. Um, we have contracts in this particular area, as you mentioned earlier. I'm the owner, operator of Sister Soldier Environmental Services. It's a woman-owned, veteran-owned, black-owned small business. We perform construction commercial cleaning for individuals in our community who may be returning home from service or incarceration. I too happen to be a lifelong resident of Hartford. I graduated all Hartford public schools. I believe in our public school system. I believe in our residents. In my first 100 days, a Jacobs administration would first go out into the community with the same soldiers that I'm out in the community with every day already and ask the people what it is that they would like to see happen in order to uh, 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 make the lives better for the children and families who live here. Um, we've had to uh, experience over several administrations, individuals getting in office, coming out into our community as long as, while they need our vote, and once they get in office, we don't see them anymore. We, we, you know, the streets of Hartford are paved with broken promises. That can no longer be the case. So there will be quite a bit of resident engagement. That would be my first priority. As I stated, we're sick and tired of politicians coming out when they need our vote, making empty promises. A Jacobs administration would also have an open line of communication and responsiveness to our residents. Oftentimes, we go out into City Hall, and if the offices are not closed, they're empty. Our residents need to be able to speak with those individuals who work for us. Every resident in the city of Hartford would know that anyone who is in office or desire to be in office work for the people. All political power is inherent in the people. I've already uh, proven myself to be honest and trustworthy, unbossed and unbought and the Jacobs administration will commit to managing the city with the same level of integrity and character, placing people and principles before politics. We promise to go beyond websites, online complaint forms, and community hotlines. The mayor's office will have an open line of a communication. When I was in the military, we had an open line, an open door policy. That needs to be the case for anyone who is attempting to be the manager of our city. The people must come first. We must invest in the people. This is our city, and we're taking it back. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm John Fonferro, and um, I want to thank Women at the Table um, for creating Women at the Table table, first of all, and for um, inviting us here to this forum this evening. Um, I'll say firstly that the approach that I will take as mayor at any time will be the same approach I've taken as state senator, which is I meet with the relevant, um, in the case of my job in the legislature, with relevant researchers, fiscal analysts, staff attorneys. I ask more questions than most people who come into the room expect to be asked. I love to learn. That's how I do my job better. We also have the benefit of an extra 100 days because whoever wins the primary will be the, the mayor of the city. And so you have 100 days before the 100 days, which I will take advantage of to um, learn as much as I can. Um, I will use that time to deliver on my commitment that I've made in this campaign, and that is that I can't achieve what I believe Hartford needs without a team, uh, without a partnership with those who work at City Hall, every teacher, every administrator, every police officer, firefighter, every employee who is the face of the city. Uh, when a resident or a business a property owner comes in asking for assistance or seeking a permit, I'll spend as much time as necessary with our current mayor, Ronan, and his senior team and with city council members. I certainly don't have a monopoly on ideas and I will ask and seek as many as I can, including from our residents. I'll meet with the leadership of every department, share my vision and what I want to understand. I want to understand their perspective, what's working well, what isn't. 
all with the premise that we are in competition for our current and prospective residents and businesses. They have choices, and our goal is to win that competition. I'll evaluate the current organizational chart and what changes are needed to implement my vision. Um, on January 1, I'll establish the offices of education, of skill development and employment, and poverty reduction. There are none of such offices today at City Hall. Um, I'll establish an office of policy research. I think it's important that we be able to go to the legislature or uh, to our Congress people to bring ideas that may not be brought off to them before. Um, make a part, make a part of city government's DNA that we will reflect the makeup of our city, including gender. Um, we'll make sure that critical projects are kept on track, not to miss a step in transition as the transition is underway. And we'll deal with the day-to-day -day unforeseen challenges, such as flooding or other issues that come along. <coughs> We will manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the city, but make no mistake, we will commence the process of implementing the objective of reducing poverty in our city and giving every child the education they need to pursue a career or college and establishing an intentional process of skilling up our residents to earn a greater wage. That's my commitment in this campaign and it will be as mayor. Hear me? So I want to thank Watt as well, women at the table. I think it's important in terms of leadership and opportunity that um, you guys are providing us so, so we can speak to the community. But first, I do want to take some of my time to reflect and give a moment of silence. Over the past four days, we had four homicides and the families have been inflicted by that trauma and Hartford continues to be in that trauma. And so, uh, Joseph Vargas Mercado, 25 years old, Alanda Vegas Martinez, 17 years old, Carolyn Williams, 65 years old, Marion Edwards, 24 years old. Let's take 10 seconds to honor them. Thank you. So I decided to walk here today because I felt it was important. You know, I have a 100-day plan, but I wanted to reaffirm that plan for the people in this community. So I decided to walk here today so I can speak to folks on the, um, on the corners and on the street and a couple businesses. And what I learned is that my plan is right on target. So the first thing that we would do is every single department that exists in the city of Hartford and that organizational chart, at the top of every chart, we will put the constituents, the people of the city of Hartford, at the top of a, or the organizational chart. It should not be the mayor. It should not be someone who's in political power. It should not be a position of patronage. The entire city be beholden to you, the people of the city of Hartford. So that's what we'll do on day one. The second thing we'll do, and what I learned on council, is that we need to fill all the positions that are vacant. The government and the position at City Hall and the positions that exist is here to serve. And so those are people in those positions. And so we need to fill those empty positions in order to provide the services that this entire community and this entire uh, city rightfully deserves. We cannot do that with a stretched staff, and that is in every department. So we have to put in a plan that is an intentional plan, targeted plan, and one that provides access to opportunity. It does not correlate the fact that we have the highest, one of the highest unemployment rates in this city, but yet we have all these jobs available at City Hall. We need to do something about that. And lastly, the Bridge Center. So, yo estoy aquí bien orgulloso, yo soy boricua, 
Y yo entiendo que hay muchos de los gente que viven aquí hablan español. Y todos los servicios, el primero es en inglés. Los websites, todos los accesos está en inglés. So what I said is, is that we have a city that is primarily dominated, not primarily, excuse me, a Latino city, and it's often spoken by people whose first language is Spanish. We have to address that. So what I'll create is the bridge center that will allow it. And I'll go more into that, but you can find more of that policy at lebronforhartford.com. Special heart for camera people, so camera people rock. First 100 days. Now, I've been quoted for the past, what, 12 years of running as everyone that works for the pleasure of the mayor needs to look for a new job. But that would be reckless and irresponsible, so certainly I wouldn't fire everyone but everyone would have to apply because we do not want to destabilize the city, nor do we want to send out a shockwave to everyone who's currently running thinking that they may become unemployed at the end of the election. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a convocation, two-day convocation where we bring together every single city employee. The city is going to absorb the cost of them attending the convocation. We'll have this either at the uh, convention center, I was gonna say civic center, but the convention center is probably a, a better venue for that. And we're gonna talk about realigning the city to be in line with my six point plan to realign the city's priorities. They're in this little flyer that I handed out to everybody. Turn your cell phone off, please. The, She's trying. She's the, There we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. Technology, what do you want? What we'll do is we'll have that convocation. We'll realign our six-point plan. If you go over that, you'll see that the number one thing we need to do in this city is make our youth the number one priority for everyone in this city, whether it's a bodega, whether it's a store, whether it's a bus driver, school, doesn't matter what it is. Our, our kids have to be our first priority. And that goes along with uh, education. So we're gonna have a convocation with our teachers as well. Secondly, we have a city that is outside of communications. We've got silos, nobody communicates with one another. So communication is gonna be a key factor in bringing the city together. And then of course, working outside of silos so that we bring people together to work together. Fourth in our priorities is public safety. I think we can all say that we have a public safety issue. The current administration ran on saying that Hartford was the most dangerous city in New England, murder capital of New England. I don't know if any of you remember that. But they're suddenly silent now when things are the same. We have to change the culture within our city. And in order to do that, we have to come together as a complete city. I've always said that the answers for Hartford are right here in Hartford. They're in this room. No one listens to you all. That's the problem. I'm applying to become your mayor. That means I'm going to work for you. If I should be fortunate enough to get the job with me because you saw fit to put me there. So you're going to be a key part of that. Maybe you're part of the NRZ. If you're not, you need to join. Maybe you're part of the town committee our first line of elected officials. These are the people who should be really contributing to our final vision. So when we hire our next police chief, as he is absolutely going to be fired, when we hire our next police chief, all of you all have to be part of that. We'll finish this later. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates. We're getting ready to take a three minute break before we move on to our next round. Vamos a tomar dos, tres minutos de descanso. Ahora vamos a ir con las preguntas de nuestra comunidad. Okay.
Listos, estamos listos para esta ronda de preguntas que ha realizado nuestra comunidad, Tiffany. And now we are going to have a wild round of questions. These are questions from Hartford residents, mostly women, and we are eager to know the answers. Every candidate will have up to two minutes to answer. We'll pick up a candidate and a question. Vamos con la ronda de preguntas. Son preguntas de residentes de la ciudad de Hartford. Vamos a escoger un candidato y una pregunta. Así que, let's go. Let's do this. Alrighty. And so I'm going to need some audience participation here. Can I have you so pick a candidate? Tiffany va a escoger allí, van a escoger el candidato ahora. Okay, let's do this. Aquí con la pregunta. All right, our first question is going to go to Arunan Arulambala. Por favor, let's, let's do the, your last name. Sure, it's Arunan Arulambalam. Okay, entendieron. Let's go, Tiffany. Vamos a hacerlo primero en español y luego en inglés. ¿Cuál es su plan para las viviendas deterioradas y animar a los dueños de casa a tener sus jardines y patios traseros en buen estado? How will you address blighted properties and encourage property owners to maintain their yards and buildings? Two minutes, sir. Can you guys hear me if I project? Yeah. All right. No. Need to use the mic. Need to use the mic for TV. Can you hear me now? There we go. Um, so in my current role, I'm, I'm CEO of the Hartford Land Bank, and we were set up to take vacant and blighted properties from the city of Hartford. And one of the problems that the city of Hartford has had for a long time is it, it is difficult for City Hall to, to move properties that are vacant and blighted quickly. And so we weren't enforcing, to the extent we could, our, the blight violations on, on, on these properties that are real problems in our neighborhoods. And I'll tell you, a lot of these problems, problem properties in our neighborhoods, as many of you already know, are, are the worst properties are many of them are owned by folks who live outside the state of Connecticut, in New York, in New Jersey, and people are making money off of a number of our problem properties. And so we've got to staff up within within our housing, housing enforcement and, and blight uh, enforcement to ensure that we can uh, hit these hit these out of town slumlords where it hurts. Um, we need to be able to take these properties from them. And at, at the state of Connecticut, um, I was part, along with Catherine Blinder, who's here, of, of initiating the first lawsuit of its kind in the nation against a slumlord in the North End, Emmanuel Koo, um, to disgorge profits, to take profits that he'd made off of those properties and bring them back to the state of Connecticut. And I've already talked to the Attorney General about trying to set up some of those cases here in, in Hartford and seeing if we could, Hartford could get a piece of those profits that they get off the settlements to help fund revitalization of those properties with Hartford-based developers. And that's the other piece of it that we do with the land bank. We ensure that all of our properties are being developed by Hartford-based developers. 100% of our properties coming down the pipeline are going to be developed by Hartford-based developers, that, in fact, all of them of color. And so we're building wealth right here in our neighborhoods while revitalizing these properties. And, and it's so important because there are so many people profiting off of the city of Hartford. And, and you know, one of, one of the things I would have talked about if I had a little more time um, in my first 100 days plan is we've got to do a citywide assessment of who owns what properties. You know, they're the same slumlords who hide behind LLC structures who own multiple properties. And if we know that there are housing code in, in, uh, uh, violations in one, they're probably all over the place. And so let's hit them where it hurts and make an example out of them and take those properties and put into productive use. Thank you. All right. Would you like to pick the candidate name, sir? <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up. Oh, actually, I'm going to ask you to pick another name because unfortunately, Bernardo Dunn is not here. Oh, what happened to you? Oh, there are the names. All right, next up, we have Tracy Funny. Ok, vamos con la versión en español. Los fumadores de marihuana están en los parques, cerca de nuestros niños 
y fumando en los edificios multifamiliares donde vivimos. Sabemos que es legal, pero ¿puede usted regular el consumo de marihuana o designar lugares específicos para fumar en la ciudad? Marijuana smokers are in the parks, near our children, and smoking in the multi-unit buildings where we live. We know it's legal, but can you regulate cannabis use or designate specific places for smoking in our city? Yes, I can, because we do have a lot of that going on in our city. Um, in the privacy of their own homes, around children in parks, it's just not acceptable, but they do it anyway. But, um, like I said, in the privacy of their homes, and that would be my go-to, the privacy of their homes. Thank you. Gracias. <laughs> Next up, we have Stan McCauley. Como madres estamos preocupadas por las pandillas y las drogas en la calle. Ahora que la marihuana es legal, el olor es insoportable. ¿Qué hará usted para asegurar la calidad de vida de las familias y la juventud? As mothers, we are concerned about gangs and drugs on the street. Now that cannabis is legal, the smell is unbearable. How can you ensure the quality of life for families and youth now? That's a great question. Uh, these are some of the issues we have when we legalize substances such as marijuana or whatever else. Uh, but it is legal, and so we as a community are gonna have to find a way to have areas where people can smoke. Uh, I remember once upon a time when companies had uh, smoking areas, and you'd, you'd come out of the out of your office building, everybody would be all huddled up in a little cubicle because you could only smoke in that little five by five box. And then it became socially unacceptable to smoke. Now, it's socially acceptable to smoke marijuana anywhere, everywhere. So I think this is gonna have to have some time to kind of like normalize. And once that does, I think we'll do fine. But until then, these are critical issues that may be part of the unintended consequences. The uh, other issues are as a matter of enforcement. Uh, if we change the way we do policing, where the community actually polices itself and the law enforcement's officers are there to enforce the laws as the community sees fit, I think we'll change that dynamic. Part of what I was talking about earlier in terms of uh, you know, public safety and community development um, economic and community development. Community development is part of that. And we have to become a city that respects one another, where we are more interested in how my neighbor feels than how I feel at my neighbor's expense. It can be done. Hartford's a small enough town that everybody knows one another when you see everybody out on the street. Oh, I seen him last week. Who does he think he is? He ain't done. If we know people like that, then we can also get to know and respect one another. It's gonna take us becoming a city that values the city, that values our communities, so that we can actually move forward as one Hartford. Thank you. Next up, we have Giselle Jacobs. Gracias, thank you. El costo de la vivienda no va con nuestros salarios. La mayoría de los residentes en Hartford vivimos debajo de la línea de la pobreza. ¿Qué hará usted para aliviar a las familias que no tienen una vivienda estable y que sufren pagando altos alquileres mes a mes? The cost of housing does not align with our salaries. Most of the residents in Hartford are living below the poverty line. What would you do to relieve families who don't have a stable home and are struggling to pay a high amount of rent month after month? 
That's a great question, and I would like to thank you for it. Um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, housing in Hartford is currently unaffordable. And as we continue to see high-end units going up, especially in downtown Hartford, the high rents are trickling down into our neighborhoods in the north and in the south end, and that's unacceptable. So the first thing we would do is stop all of that building of high-end units. It needs to cease. We have properties right now in the city of Hartford that we're giving away to developers, nonprofits, for a dollar when individuals are homeless. There's research out there that says that when land banks are under the municipality, there's a greater opportunity to monitor the monies that's being made off of those said properties. I would like to see, if I were mayor, I would like to see a Hartford administration doing more to house our homeless, to put our Hartford homeless residents first above developers, above individuals who are coming from out of town taking advantage of Hartford being for sale. Ain't that right, Nick? Hartford can no longer be for sale. Thank you. Next, we have Nick LeBron. Muchos ancianos tienen ingresos fijos limitados y pagan impuestos muy altos. ¿Qué hará para ayudar a estos adultos mayores a seguir siendo dueños de su casa? Hello. Oh, okay. We gotta wait for you. <laughs> yes, please. Many fixed income seniors have trouble remaining independent and in their own homes due to property taxes. What would you do to help them keep their homes? So. I'm not sure if I heard, how much time do we have to respond? Two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. So I was just at the North End Senior Center this morning, and I think it's a very relevant and very poignant question. One of the things that we have to understand with our senior population, I think the first thing is, is that most of them are on a fixed income. And right, and so when you're on a fi fixed income, I think about my abuelitas, my grandmothers, and any kind of, bill or anything out of their budget really makes everything in disarray. And so when you have folks that are on, on uh, fixed incomes, what we have to do is provide opportunities that they all can uh, partake in. See, there's a lot of programs that exist, not only internally, but also throughout the state. The problem is the digital divide. What we found is during COVID is that seniors weren't getting access because they didn't know how to apply online to get vaccines, to get tested. And so how are we going to expect them to, do, to, to get the outreach that they so rightfully deserve? So the answer not only comes from within the city with all the programs and outreach and making sure that it reaches the seniors, but as well as outside the city, because there's our, there are multiple state-funded programs and federally-funded programs that can assist our seniors to help keep them where they rightfully deserve in their own home. Thank you. Gracias. Next up, we have Eric Coleman. Las organizaciones sin fines de lucro en Hartford juegan un, un rol vital, creando comunidades más saludables y proveyendo servicios críticos para su estabilidad económica. ¿Qué hará para asegurar que estas organizaciones nuevas y antiguas reciben oportunidades y financiamiento para seguir ayudando a cada individuo y familia? Not 
nonprofit organizations in Hartford play a vital role in creating healthy communities and providing critical services that contribute to economic stability. As mayor, which policies would you implement to ensure that all nonprofit organizations, new and old, receive fair opportunities when it comes to grants and support so that they may continue to assist every individual and family? <laughs> Thank you for the question. I think it is a great question. Um, what I would, uh, what immediately comes to mind for me with respect to nonprofit um, organizations, and I agree they play a essential role uh, in the city of Hartford, providing services to the most vulnerable uh, among us, the most vulnerable populations among us. Um, I would put in place an evaluation system um, in connection with any uh, application for a grant by a nonprofit organization. I would uh, seek to have the nonprofit organization uh, clearly indicate what services they're going to provide, uh, how many people uh, they intend to help. Uh, and to put in place other uh, criteria or uh, indicators measurable uh, of measurable outcomes. So to the extent that uh, they apply for a certain amount of money, I would endeavor to grant them that certain amount of money on uh, at least the initial application. But after that, uh, I think the grant should be awarded on a competitive basis and depend upon uh, what kind of successful outcomes are achieved. In other words, did the nonprofit organization do and accomplish uh, what they said they were going to do and accomplish? Uh, an evaluation system is what I would rely upon in order to determine who gets what and how much. Thank you. Gracias. Last but certainly not least, John Fanfara. ¿Cómo asegura que la policía de Hartford reclute personas de diferentes razas que trate a los residentes con respeto y justicia y que castigue a policías que violan los derechos humanos? How would you ensure that the Hartford Police Department continues to recruit people of color, treats all citizens with respect and justice, and punishes police force members who violate human rights? With respect to the first part of your question, I have advocated for some time that the city of Hartford establish a program for training Hartford residents to become police officers. I think we should establish programs go far beyond police officers, but specifically with respect to police officers. We do more in this state, in this country, to prepare a young boy to, be, to play um, Pop Warner football, to play high school football, to play college football, than we do to train someone to be a Hartford police officer. We've talked for decades about having our police department reflect the uh, population of our city, and yet every time a new class finishes the program, there are more that look like me than look like most in this room and what our city uh, uh, um, ethnically and racially represents. If we're intentional about changing that, we will. And we can have a two-year, a one-year, a three-year program pay young people of Harvard a stipend in order to be able to uh, uh, support their family while they're going through the training program. And you'll see many more people of color coming through the program and being police officers in Hartford. To date, we have not been intentional. I came off of I-91 I recently, um, where the Yardco Stadium is, and what was facing me was a um, lit sign saying, apply to the Hartford Police Department to be an officer. That's not intentional. That's not what we, if we really want to change the collection of the Hartford Police Department, we have to do much more work. And if I'm mayor of Hartford, 
we will. With respect to treating um, the residents of Hartford uh, appropriately, that starts in the office that I seek and making sure that whoever the chief is and everyone below that chief understands that they are in service to the residents of Hartford. Being a police officer is a tough job and they generally aren't called because that for good things. But they will understand that, um, that the attitude and the approach that they take to our residents will be positive or they won't be on the force much longer. Thank you. That's yes. Thank you. We are now going to take a two minute break and then receive questions from the audience. Vamos a tomar dos minutos de descanso y vamos a permitir que la audiencia le haga preguntas a nuestros candidatos. Eh, Alguien, el que quiera hacer una pregunta, que levante la mano. If you have questions, please raise your hand. And I will do my best Mira. to get to everyone. Okay, primera pregunta, first question. What is going to be done about getting the addicts and prostitutes out of our streets? They need help, and no one is paying them any mind. We talk about a lot of things except them. What are we going to do to help them out? Now, uh, Someone is going to pick up the candidate to answer. My question was, what is going to be done to help out the addicts and the prostitutes, including the homeless that are in our community? Because they do need help, and we talk about many things except that. What can we do or what are you going to do to be able to help this situation? And the candidate is uh, Giselle Jacobs. Oh. Yeah, ready? <laughs> Two minutes? Okay. The first thing we need to do is let the addicts and the prostitutes know that they're still human. They're deserving of the help. I'm sure there's not too many people in this room that probably doesn't have someone in their family who have experienced uh, substance abuse, prostitution, crime. You know, uh, help is available. One of the uh, items that I have on my list of solutions that I would like to, that I intend to bring to the community is as we begin to police ourselves, working in conjunction with our police departments. I, you know, I came up with a name, but of course the community, we can vote on something, right? But I called it like, um, we would call them Hartford heroes and sheroes, right? Like my soldiers, when we go out into the community to help one another better our lives, whether it's through employment, whether it's through assisting them with finding housing, we can assist them with finding a bed and treatment. We can assist the young women and men, we have men and women prostituting, right? We can assist them in getting the help that they need, which is what we do anyways, every day. It's a whole bunch of us in here right now tonight that do that for a living and that do that without a paycheck at the end of it. We have to be our own solution. Right? As we begun to come together as a community in love and unity and help those who are out on the streets as opposed to judging them and shunning them, give them some hope. Our streets are full of the hopeless. That doesn't need to be the case, right? Um, like I like to say, one of those shootings that took place the other night, we had four killings. In the last few days, we've had four killings. I could not get to my front door as a result of the yellow tape because of a domestic violence killing that took place across the street from my son Isaiah, he might not like the fact that I mentioned his name, just recently purchased a three-family home in our community. And I have now a three-year-old grandson that had to wake up to yellow tape as a result of that domestic violence killing. We have to do better, but it starts with us, and we can do it, Thank one you. another. Come Thank together. you. Thank you. All right, next question. Uh, 
Hello, everybody. My name is Sherry Frazier. We, the city of Harper gets a number of grants, and the grants are given to a number of individuals within our community. The mayor is usually there, smiling with the person, the person, the individual gets the check, but the community never sees any improvement. One, one area got five million dollars. The Barker Street area. No improvement. Nobody's accountable for the money. You talk to the state agencies, that state agency go, what? Somebody went to the Department of Justice. So within 90 days, we will find out where that money went. My question to you, if you become mayor, what would you do to make sure that the normal money, the normal um, money that the um, city gets and the grant money are separated and everything is accountable for? This question goes to Ben Ferris. Actually, we'll no, actually the question goes to. No. Yeah. Too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not John Von Vera. Um, you know, there, there, was a, there was a question earlier um, about nonprofits and, uh, and, and the ways in which we fund nonprofits. And I think this is really tied to that. I, I, I'm going to say something that may feel like it's meant to sound inflammatory, it's not. I think we have an issue with the nonprofit industrial complex in the city. We have a lot of nonprofits here that, that are covering similar territory, that, that are doing similar things. Um, and very often, whether somebody gets funding or not has more to do with the relationship that that, and, and I'm, I'm the head of a nonprofit, right? With the more to do with the relationship that, that, that the head of that nonprofit has with, with specific politicians or, or foundations or corporations than it does the work that's being done. And so one thing I would like to do uh, is work with the Hartford Foundation to try to create a report card for nonprofits so we can take a look at housing and take a look at all of the players in that space and figure out who's doing what and where are they covering similar territory in education, in literacy programs, in, in economic development. You know, where are we covering similar territory? And then maybe have some conversations with boards of directors to say, look, we, 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 we are a very poor city, but a lot of resources get spent here. You know, one of the greatest resources we have are, are dollars that don't never go through City Hall uh, or, or, or to one kind of funnel source, but go through our nonprofits. There are millions of dollars getting spent in nonprofits. And if we're duplicating services and staff and, and uh, efforts, and, and, uh, and, and as a result of that, the impact is less. Or if, if there are nonprofits that survive purely because of relationships they have with those in power, then we should call that out and we should create a system in which there's a streamlined way to fund the things that this city needs and, and to fund nonprofits to, for, for a timeline. Look, there's a reason that there are so many nonprofits in Hartford and not as many in Glastonbury and Avon and Simsbury. It is because we have not thought about how we build wealth and how we as a city have, have an, a, a group of residents who are able to be middle, build middle class lives over the next 10 and 20 years. And if that's our vision, then we go, don't get to feel good about paying that dollar to a nonprofit, but maybe we can build something that's sustainable right here in Hartford. Thank you, gracias. Let me, she has a question, okay? La va a hacer en español, Liani Arroyo la va a traducir. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Milano. Yo quiero preguntar, Con tanto crimen que está pasando en Halford, especialmente nuestros jóvenes, ¿qué vamos a hacer? ¿Qué servicio se le va a dar a los jóvenes? Porque si ustedes saben, esto es parte de la salud mental y los programas de salud mental que están, que hay, no, no, no funcionan. She would like to know, with all of the crime that's happening, particularly among youth, what is the plan to address that? That a lot of these issues around crime are mental health issues, 
And as such, many of the mental health programs are not functioning, and so we have this, this crime. So what, what is the intention of the person that's gonna answer? Stan McCulley. Uh, once again, we need to come together as a community. But when you're talking about our youth, and you talk about impact, uh, you talk about the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, what we're seeing with our youth, with violence, is a, it's a, it's a public health issue. A lot of people process it as a crime issue because there's criminal dollars to fight crime. So in a poor city like Hartford, it becomes a fundraising mechanism. We talk about people in Glastonbury, the reason they don't have a lot of nonprofits is because they come to work in Hartford at the nonprofits at six-figure six figure salaries and then they go back to Simsbury Avon. And so we become the means to an end. I've said this many times, maybe new to some of you. We don't have to pick cotton because we are the cotton. And that's gonna continue until you and Hartford say you've had enough. So until we see the people, as someone said, I think it's Giselle, as having value to where we begin to reach out to them, Petra Sagata said to me, you know, Stan, there's a reason why we can't hire the people that we need to hire because there's a lot of mental health issues in the city which make them unemployable. Well, he knew that, and he's not the first to understand that. Plenty of people know it, but where's the intentionality to solving the problem? So the path, of, path to impact can't be the program. The path to impact has to be those impacted by said program. The programs we have now by anybody's definition in this room, is not working. And until you hire somebody to be your boss, not your boss, to be the boss of the people who are doing the work, Thank you. nothing's gonna change. Thank you, gracias. <laughs> Tiffany, you? Thank you, next question. Hello, well, my name is Ellen Nurse, and I live in the oh. South Green Nation. Oh. Louder, Miss Nurse. Let me, I'm gonna bring this. Hi, uh, my name is Ellen Nurse, and I live in the South Green neighborhood. The street I live on looked like the day the, the plants took over the earth. <laughs> the coming, they got, they don't clean the streets. They have plants growing from the streets on the side but when you go to other neighborhoods, it don't look like that. I want my street to look just like those street looks on Wesleyan Terrace on Cherry Road. Amen. What are y'all gonna do to do something to improve the DPW? Uh, oh. <laughs> what are y'all gonna do to improve DPW? DPW workers are the lowest paid in the city, okay? We need, and most of them are city residents. Yes, so we need to make sure, when you want to give the police a, 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 a raise, and most of them live outside the city, give the DT, DPW workers a raise. And I say that because they live in the city. Years ago, you have to live in the city to, to be a policeman or fireman. They don't do that anymore. You go to other towns, you go to Philadelphia. You better live in that city if you want a job. In Chicago, if they find out you don't live in that city, you lose your job. So we need to change the rules so that you have to live in the city. They will make a difference in how, how the city looks. Thank you. The candidate that is going to apply do some remarks is John Van Paren. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> You'll never change. <laughs> and, and, and we're better off for it. Um, 
I don't know, I guess you're referring, Ellen, to the strip on the side of the road between the sidewalk and the road, because that's, but generally that's the responsibility of the property owner. I don't know who owns the properties in your street, if you have a condo association or whatever, but. I'm president of it. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> I guess, I guess your neighbors know who to go to then, but, um, um, but in general, what we're talking about when we talk about blight or the questions that have come up before, drug use or safe places for children to go, our city is, is incredibly poor. We have neighborhoods that the intensity of poverty is um, greater than 40% of the population living below the federal poverty level. You can't survive in the neighborhood. If you grow up as a child in a neighborhood like that, and by the way, 40% of Hartford's residents live in a census tract that is considered concentrated poverty. Not, not, not everyone in that census tract is poor, but when you have that level of poverty, you know what you get. Crime is higher, schools are underperforming, there's blight, um, there is high unemployment, and, and folks aren't able to, as Arudin said a minute ago, have the quality of life that most in our state enjoy. And until we as, and I happen to believe that the responsibility of the next mayor and the city government has to be, has to be about taking on uh, reducing poverty in our city, two ways. One, we have to ensure that our, the education of our children, that our children are receiving is no than that and just over the line in West Hartford, or as Ben mentioned here tonight, in Glastonbury. Too many of our kids are starting kindergarten unready. Too many kids are starting third grade not reading. And if you're not doing those two things, your income on average is lower in your life. Your chance, your, 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 the chances of being incarcerated are higher. And in fact, your lifespan is shorter. And City Hall to date, and no mayor has sought to, um, to address the issues of our educational system. We've ceded it entirely to the school system. I don't believe that's the case. We should be doing that. Secondly, we have to skill up our residents. The skills of our residents has to be able to be able command a better wage. And you'll see in this city an enthusiasm, an, an absolute enthusiasm of, in terms of how people feel about the city, how they see the city, and in terms of the investment in our city, our school system improving, our housing stock improving, crime will reduce, taxes will be reduced, but to date we have not focused on ensuring that our educational system works, I will, and ensuring that we're, we're training our residents for the jobs that we exist to have here in hospitals and at the travelers, we can employ our people in those buildings. Thank you, gracias. Could the organizers of this event make sure that the candidates Answer the question. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Oh, you want to hold the mic? Yes. Really? Really. I seen everybody else hold the mic for themselves. I'm different. Oh, she she wants. To, I really don't need it, so you can take the mic. So I have a question. You respect the See if you can get an answer. Excuse me. See if you can get an answer. Oh, okay. I I, I will, <laughs> Alyssa. I promise. Okay, thank you. I have a question for Arunin, Eric Coleman, John Fonfera, and Nick LeBron. Why am I asking this question? Because I see four people that have been in office for quite some time, especially Eric. Well, not so much Nick. You're, you're, you're Arunin, I mean Arunin newcomer, uh, and John Fonfera. All of these issues that we're talking about as it pertains to education, housing, poverty, blighted housing, and economic development have existed, uh, can we say, I, I, I like the audience to agree with me, can we say for at least three presidents, three, not presidents, three mayorships, Cigar, Eddie, what, how, why should we trust you now that you've been around so long and we're still addressing the same issues for three decades. That's my Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. This question goes to Nick LeBron, please. All right. So, Marcus, 
Marcus, this is for me, right? You want to answer all of them? You go ahead. So I was one of the ones you called out, so I think it's important. Let me just, I, I want to emphasize the fact that, that though the issues existed since before I was born. That's true. Okay? It hasn't been three presidencies. Five. It's been longer. Okay? So as, as Nick LeBron is someone that was born and raised in this city, and I'm a Hartford success story, you ask the question as counsel, right? Unless you want me to answer the question, right? So being on counsel, I want to be able to do more with more as mayor. See, because while I was on council, we had the worst pandemic that the city's ever seen. And I was the chair of Health and Human Services. And myself and the administration, we saved lives. We were the first out there to put out vaccines. We were the first to provide testing, right? Those are the things that I was able to do. Not only in the position now, I created something called the Heart Team. And what that is is a differential response. It's the first of it in this country. In this country. It is innovative. It, pro it provides an alternative to 911 and police responding. We all know as a city that when you have trauma and police show up to rectify it as a 911, there is a likelihood is that that outcome is not going to be what that person needs. We have homelessness. We have. Uh, substance abuse. We have all the things that we're talking about. So when you call 911, you should get the type of program that you deserve. So those are the things that I've done. But Marcus, what I understood more, more broadly is that oftentimes political people are dream sellers. Mm. And what I want to be as a mayor is a truth teller. And so I plan on being able to do more with more, focus on the issues, and be able to implement the things that we all rightfully deserve in this city. We have the largest wealth gap, we have the largest achievement gap, and we're coming off a year with the most murder since the Latin King Wars of the 1990s. So when are we gonna tell ourselves that the way that we're approaching it now, and that, it, that our mayoral election is being bought right now? When are we going to learn that that is not working for us? Hartford is not for sale. The for sale sign needs to come down. Gracias. Thank you. Another question. Hi, good evening. My name is Marta Reynolds, and I, I drive for a living. <laughs> Silent, please. Thank you. Again, my name is Martha Ramos. I drive in the city of Hartford for a company, and I'm in the four corners of Hartford and the state of Connecticut. The dirtiest is Hartford. Our streets look yeah. terrible, yeah. mattresses, furniture, TVs in every corner. The city used to pick them up years ago. What happened? What happened? Our city looks terrible. Can we clean that up, please? It's Spanish. En la yo soy chofera en la ciudad de Hartford y yo guío por todos lados de Hartford. La más la ciudad más sucia es Hartford. Yes. Los madres, los viudos, todo por la calle. El city antes lo recogía, ya no. ¿Qué pasó? Vamos a limpiar a Hartford. Yes. Tiffany, who is going to answer? Thank you for your question. This question goes to Eric Coleman. All right, thank you very much for the question. Uh, as I've campaigned for this office and talked to people across the city, they have wanted uh, and have expressed to me that they're interested in certain things. Public safety, uh, they want to make sure that they're living in a city that is safe. They want to make sure that they're living in a city where the schools are properly preparing young people for the future. They want to live in a city where economic development is taking place in a manner. They want to live in a city where economic development is taking place in a manner that taxes are not unduly burdensome, that people have a fair opportunity to become employed, uh, where housing is adequate, where the quality of life 
is good where services are provided in an efficient and a timely manner. Uh, this question uh, is very similar to the one that was asked about public works. And I think uh, there is a correlation between staffing at public works and the salaries that people are paid at, at public works. Um, it seems to me that one of the easiest services that an administration can provide is to make sure that the streets are clean, that garbage is collected in a timely manner, that streets are repaired uh, adequately. The potholes uh, on all of the streets that I drive on are horrendous. You can damage your car hitting a pothole uh, in the streets of Hartford. It makes, it escapes me uh, why the city cannot do a better job of repairing the streets. And in the Coleman administration, as I discuss and review the performance of departments, uh, city department heads, like the public works department head, would be held accountable and would have to respond concerning why the streets are not clean properly, why the potholes that uh, exist, exist, and how we can do a better job. What is it gonna take in order for us to do a better job? Thank you, gracias. So now the last question. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you everyone, my name is uh, Bridget Prince and I would like to talk about something that's currently happening. Uh, happened Sunday, happened on the 4th of July, and it's now no longer affecting the north end of Hartford where we were dealing with the sewage overflows. It is now also happening in the south end of Hartford. That's the flood overflows. Um, everybody now in the city is dealing with this. What I want to talk about, and I want to ask the question, but what I want to talk about is uh, flood mitigation funds that's coming out of the city of Hartford. Uh, a couple of years ago, when it was first, when it first came to the city through FEMA, uh, there was an application process with a lot of obnoxious questions. Now, you were flooded here on Park Street because of what all these candidates are saying: poor maintenance, uh, lack of um, lack of um, employment, and probably lack of care and lack of leadership. So now you have your homes and your um, property, vehicles and everything damaged because the city's not maintaining it. But when you go and you have to apply for funding, then you have to, this is income based. They need to know if you have delinquent taxes. They need to know if you have, uh, uh, if, you, if you're back on your child support. They need to ask a whole lot of questions that has nothing to do with their negligence. So right now, since uh, the MDC is, oh, you want my question? Okay. Uh, okay. Give me like, give me 10 seconds to give my, to answer my question. So now, okay, okay. So now, now since the MDC is charged with um, fixing what they're gonna fix, um, the city no longer needs the money to do sewage um, repairs, to do sump pumps, to do uh, backwater valves, to do um, laterals. So that $7,500 that they were given to every person, that city now has that money which equates to probably millions of dollars. So what are you gonna do to make sure the city doesn't keep all of this, uh, the FEMA funding like they kept the COVID relief funds? Whoa. What is anybody gonna do? Tiffany? Oh, Tiffany, the, the question. Tiffany, the candidate. Thank you. This question goes to Tracy Funny, please. We're going to get that money because there's a lot of money missing. Today, while I was at work, six million I heard of, they don't know where the money at. And I work at the United Way. So that was brought to my attention. So me, me and the mayor, we're going to clean up our city together. We're going to hire more individuals to clean our streets. Because I hear a lot of that. My most housing, 
we're going to deal with that problem too and everything else in our city. This is not a one individual job. It's everybody's job. So Bridget, we're going to get that money. Thank you. That's it. I have a question, please. No, I'm sorry. I have a question, please. Ya, ya terminamos en la sesión de, de las preguntas. Yo quiero una pregunta. Todo el mundo está hablando que el jefe está sucio. Pero nadie dice que vamos a hacer con todas las personas de ambulantes, drogaditos que están en la calle, que están ensuciando la calle, que le dan un overdose, salen del hospital y vienen con el light con el light down, caminando para la calle. Ok. Yo quiero que vamos a hacer con esta persona que yo tengo un negocio en la Park Street y eso está afectando mi negocio. Gracias, muy amable. Now, uh, Thank you. Now we're going to have final remarks from each candidate. If so, you please keep it for under yeah. one minute. So what she's talking, uh, I just want to just acknowledge that we have a resident that um, is affecting the budget. So I understand, but you know, I think her voice should be heard. Answer the question. Answer the question. You want, I, 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 can I answer the question? Okay, I mean, I'm just trying to follow the rules. All right. Okay. Thank you, Nick. There's some rules that we have to respect. All right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No. This is the opportunity for all of us to, uh, to listen to them. But with respect, no. This is what is doing this. No, okay. There, there is no more question allowed. Thank you. from the candidates and you can answer all, all of the things that you want to. So I'll, I'll, I'll start, so what I'll, what I'll do, yeah, yeah, what I'll do is I'll start, I'll answer the question as part of my final statement. How about that? So that, that way it's a compromise. As, as a leader of the city, we gotta figure out how to compromise. So I'll use my time to answer that question. I'll answer it now. Is that okay? So what, um, ¿Cómo tú te llamas? Mi nombre. Uh -huh. No, I'm about to translate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tengo uh un negocio aquí en la pared tri. En 532 de la pared tri tengo un negocio. Este, ayudo a los ambulantes, doy comida los sábados. Este, le doy ropa, voy abajo de los puentes a darle sábana, darle esto y ayudarlo. Mi pregunta es, aquí no hay ningún programa que ayude a los ambulantes, le dan un overdose, caen en el hospital, al otro día viene con, el, con, el, con, la, con la levanta del hospital a buscar, lo, a buscar el peso en la parque este. Y caen preso porque se robaron algo, porque hicieron algo, al otro día salen de la cárcel, no lo meten en un programa, no lo ayudan a hacer nada, no hacen nada, lo sacan para la calle otra vez, como si no pasó nada, a que sigan haciendo lo mismo, y yo creo que eso es lo que está sucediendo en la calle de la ciudad de Highfall. ¿Por qué? Porque ellos se comen la comida en la calle, lo tiran en la basura, y hacen todo lo que les, lo que les cuesta la gana, van y recogen, tiran, andan con unos carros llenos de cosas, lo tiran, lo dejan botado. Entonces, no, no lo accidente, es lo que están en la calle que están haciendo esta cosa. All right, that's a lot to translate. Ambulante, what does that mean, Council President? Ambulante, I just want to translate it correctly. Homeless, all right. So the question is around homelessness and the fact that homelessness is affecting negatively the, the, the businesses that exist in the city of Hartford. And what she's saying is that what she's seeing is a revolving door. They come out, they go back in, and it starts all over again. Well, and she owns a business, right? She owns a business, and so this is a constant problem. She tries her best to be able to solve that problem. She tries to help them. She sees them go in and then come back out. So the question is around homelessness, and I'll conclude with this. So, Okay, not a problem. Okay, so council president and okay, so I, can I answer? All right, so but can I answer it though? Why, why does it? I, I was gonna. Come. Well, let me, let me start by saying this. There is a lot of passion in this room, and it's because 
we, we all love this city so much. And what I don't want to see is, is a city that tears itself apart because of our passion for the city. We have business owners in this room, we have residents in this room, we have, we have people who are in the service in, you know, in industry, we have people who are, are elected officials, and all of us have a deep love and passion for the city of Hartford. So let's, let's, let's just start by trying to, trying to walk this together um, because it's so important that we hang together as a city. Our homeless population, um, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's so telling the way we approach our homeless population and oftentimes has more to say uh, about the, the person who is addressing them than, than the resident themselves. We have a lot of folks in the city that we talked about the high cost of living uh, in, in, and the rising, rising cost in the city that because of an inadequate apply, uh, uh, supply of housing and, and, market, and, and affordable housing are, are, have lost their homes. And that's also a problem um, for, for a whole host of reasons for our neighborhood businesses. Um, and and we, we need a comprehensive solution to homelessness that doesn't squeeze them into commercial corridors like Park Street, and I've seen it do, and, 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 and the population that, that gathers around Barnard Park um, that, that lets out from the numerous shelters during the day and, and that gets services from the methadone clinic uh, that they are so quick to, to place within neighborhoods like this. Uh, it, it, it has such a major impact on the residents and the businesses around here. And it doesn't do its service for that population. And so I think approaching our homes. Hartford is a city that's confronted with a number of challenges, not the least of which is homelessness. In, in order to uh, adequately address homelessness, the needs of the unhoused, as well as the needs of business owners who, whose business operation may be affected adversely because of uh, vagrancy and uh, the homeless population. Obviously, we need to provide more opportunities for shelter, for homeless people. I don't understand uh, why that building that used to be the YMCA on Jewel Street is standing unoccupied and unused uh, when it could be refurbished. In my estimation, could be refurbished to provide some shelter for at least some of our homeless population. We also need to be uh, more Im immersed in work workforce development and case management services so that those people uh, who are unhoused can receive the treatment that they need as well as the referrals that they need uh, in order to make some progress in their lives. There was once a time when Hartford was considered one of the richest cities in the country. Right now, we are considered the seventh worst run city in the country. And it's not that we don't have the resources to address homelessness. We need to be more intentional about wanting to address the homelessness. You're looking at someone who was once homeless. I was at the South Park and today I am a homeowner. Today I am a business owner. Today I am a licensed real estate agent. And I would like to see more individuals in our community become homeowners so that they can begin to build generational wealth for their families. It's possible. Maybe some of those properties that we are giving away to developers, you know, we talk about nonprofit, uh, institutionalized, uh, nonprofit. Listen, we have a not my nonprofit has been in existence since 2008. I've never gotten a grant from the city of Hartford, state, or feds. We use our monies out of our hard earned pay to help one another. But you could have another nonprofit that's been in existence for two years. That budget is four million four hundred ninety thousand dollars plus. We need to be more intentional and pay attention to what's going on with our money in Hartford. Yes. That's our money, and it needs to go to the people, not developers, not nonprofits, the people. Yes. 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 Is, this, is this minute our closing remarks? No. Okay. So um, I think we can end homelessness in Hartford. 
um, we have the ability to, whether we have the will or in the state of Connecticut. Um, some years, several years ago, the Magwood Shelter called me and said, we'd like to get out of the shelter business. We want to get into the trans transitional housing business. And they sold it on saying, we're going to have people be there two years, maybe three years, get on their feet, be support systems, and then into their own place. Unfortunately, the first part happened. I supported them getting the building. It's up there, it's right down the street here. But they never got out of the shelter business, and the people who live there are there permanently. So that process of moving folks who are chronically homeless to a transition process for two or three years with the services that are absolutely needed to get folks on their feet and then into their own place never happened. But that's the process, if I'm mayor, that we will adopt. Thanks. And we'll begin to see Maybe there always would be some need for shelters to a degree, but not to the degree where the homeless folks who are chronically homeless will be in and out of shelters, under a bridge, in a park. Um, we can do better, and we will. I, does this one work? So to address the issue of homelessness, what we have to understand is that we have to be able to tell ourselves the truth. And the fact of the matter is, the city of Hartford is the hub for all homeless services. Yes. So we're taking on the burden for the entire region and getting zero compensation. This is a shared problem. The recent statistics show that more than 50% of these homeless residents, their original address comes from out of town. But yet, we receive no state funding and no, uh, uh, no assistance from the other surrounding towns. But yet, we continue to the narrative as they point the fingers that everyone in Hartford is homeless. We can't have a city that has 50% non-taxable base and yet be the burden and yet, and yet have to take on the entire homeless service system that is not congruent, that is not uh, 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 conducive to having an accountable system for the, yeah, I'm sorry, I just, I, I would just like the last 10 seconds to fit for myself, I was a little bit distracted. You okay, babe? All right, okay. Is there a rule against signs? Okay, all right. So, the point is, the point of the matter is, is that the city continues to take on the burden for a lot of essential services and basic human needs for the entire region. It is not substantial and it is not feasible. We have to seek the resources from the region and from surrounding towns and demand they help us. The under-homed, the homeless, the chronically homeless. I hear a lot of things in there, and we could talk about this ad nauseum for a long time. But her problem that I think I understood is the situation that's happening here. And that is something that, believe it or not, can be solved if there's some intentionality around it. We might start with actually having the conversation with the people who are going to be impacted by the problem. We talk about the homeless as though they are something out there and we're gonna make the decisions for them. They actually are human beings with wants, needs, aspirations, and desires. And if you talk to them, you would be shocked at their solutions to the problem. Like I keep saying, the problems that Hartford have can be solved by the people that actually live in the city. Our job, my job, is to help you bring what you see as a solution to a manifestation. I bet you we get the, the homeless person, we get her and her fellow business people together, we can come up with a solution. And under a Macaulay administration, that's what you will have. Thank you, Stan. Um, I'm just going to sum it up to say um, I'm around homelessness every day, day in, day out. 
So the only problem is they need help and we know that. The solution is to just help them. Um, one night I was over Park Street at the Walgreens getting milk and I seen a guy, he said he just got out of jail and he looked like he just got out of jail. And I said to him, why are you out here? I just got out of jail. That very morning I woke up, he was on the news because he's homeless. So help is what they need and help is yes. definitely what they're going to get. Yes. Thank you. Gracias. So now the final remarks, and it's going to be one minute for each candidate. Let's start with it. Well, we started off this night um, talking about the first 100 days and what that looks like. And I think it's easy to come to these forums and think that it has to do with those of us who are up here. But I think it has to do so much with all of you who are in this room and who pack this room because you care about the future of the city. And I'm just, you know, I, I feel like I can waste, you know, take more than 20 minutes talking about people in this room. But, you know, I, I, I'm looking at Miguel right down my line of sight, who's, who's our son's barber, who uh, on, in his free time gives, gives uh, the unhoused population free haircuts. Uh, Lauren Little is here, who's taking a vacant lot on Clark Street and turning it into an urban farm to, to create fresh produce and whole foods in our neighborhood. Her brother Malcolm started a running club where, where folks are coming into this city and running through our neighborhoods and experiencing our neighborhoods for the first time um, in a community of runners. And, and there's so many people here who are doing really cool, innovative stuff in the city. And, and a mayor at its very best is somebody who can embody the energy of the city and who, who can empower each of our residents to be their best because there's so much potential in the city and that potential lies in each and every one of you. Good evening, again, thank you to Watt uh, for conducting this forum. Thank you for all of you in the audience for your participation. Uh, as was indicated, my name is Eric Coleman, and I've enjoyed uh, the blessing of having had the opportunity of serving in the state legislature as a state representative, as a state senator, and I've also had the opportunity to serve as a Superior Court judge. All of the skills uh, that I acquired uh, in my public service are immediately transferable to the duties and responsibilities of a mayor of the city of Hartford. I want to be the mayor of the city of Hartford, obviously, because I care about the city of Hartford, uh, but also because uh, I remember Hartford um, of the 70s and the 80s. And I want to, I believe I have the capacity and the ability and the determination to help the city of Hartford recapture the glory that it, it once had. Thank you for your attention. I would be very pleased to have the opportunity to serve as your mayor. And so would I. <laughs> yeah. One of my customers on the West End gave me this song for you all. The beat of Hartford, you can feel it everywhere. Hartford was once one of the wealthiest cities in the country, and we still are if we keep track of where our money is going. With the Giselle Jacobs administration, we will know that. We will have an administration that's run honored, honestly, with integrity, by someone who's not a lawyer, or a politician, or already at City Hall in a position to make a difference. Yes. It's time for us everyday regular folk to say no more. If all political power is inherent in the people and all free government is founded on their authority and that they shall have at all times an undeniable, indefeasible right to alter their form of government in such manner as we think expedient, we need to do it. We have the power to do it, and it's time to do it now. Thank you. I want to, I want to thank all of you for taking time out of your day to be here uh, to listen to us tonight and answer the questions. I want to thank Watt for uh, organizing this event. It was asked earlier tonight, why should we trust you? You've been in office. Fair question. 
You're sitting in a building in which, um, until three years ago, the, the neighborhood here, in terms of library services, had a shoebox library across the street that was rat infested. This community, Representative Minnie Gonzalez, Ana Alfaro, and others said, we need better. I fought for $12 million to build this building that we're sitting in today. Across the street, there is a walk-in manufacturing facility here on Park Street and Albany Avenue that I fought to get a million dollars to open up. They are hiring people, they are training and hiring people today because of that work. There is a renovated police athletic, uh, 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 police athletic league uh, facility over on Williams Street that is helping kids throughout our city. I've worked for a new boys and girls club over on the east side that was desperately needed in the neighborhood that doesn't have any. And lastly, I got a lineman apprenticeship program for, to increase the number of black and Latino linemen at Eversource, of which there are very, very few. It's a fair question, and hopefully that helps. So thank you to Juan, and thank you everyone for attending today. I love the energy and the spirit. It's exactly the vibrancy that the Hartford that I was born and raised in. So as a person that was born and raised in Hartford and a Hartford success story, you know, I have a unique ability to not only understand the professional, have the, the uh, professional background, but also the personal background and, uh, and the personal stories to be able to understand how not only policies are developed at a high level and how to develop those policies, but how those things are operationalized and or, or delivered to you so that you get the policy as it was intended. There are three things that a LeBron administration will be able to focus on, and it's not LeBron being in front, it's LeBron being on the side with you. And that is number one, safe streets and safe communities. We need to be able to go home, we need to be able to feel safe when we go to work, and, and so forth and so on. The other thing is access to economic opportunity. We need access to these opportunities for everyone, not just for a few. And the other thing is being able to unify this city. We no longer, we no longer can be divided. Together we can conquer all. Thank you. I hand each of you almost each of you, a uh, little insert that was in the Hartford News. It's the path to impact, all right? If you go to my website, macaulayformayor.com, you can read it. If you write this phone number down, 860-944-9797, that is my cell phone number, has been for at least the last 12 years. If you call me, I will come over and we can have coffee and chop it up. I'm applying to work for you. All of us are applying to work for you. It's your government. The question is, are you willing to do your part in holding accountable us? This has to go beyond rhetoric and campaign speeches. It has to go to who's willing to do the job for you, all right? You gotta do your part and get out and vote. That's why I'm running again for the fourth time, because I have yet to win. I haven't lost. You lose, and every time you lose, you come back around to one of these things to ask, why can't we do better? That's a question only you can ask, I mean answer, and you can do it September the 12th when you vote for J. Stan McCall, Tracy. Thank you, Mr. McCall. Um, first, I want to say thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I apologize for being late, but it's called work. Um, I missed the first part, so my first 100 days would be hiring Hartford, Connecticut residents. That's my first 100 days, and continue on, um, and just doing the best for the city. That's it, and for our residents. Um, the North End of Hartford is totally, totally being ignored and I'm tired of it being ignored. That's the purpose of me sitting at this table and I'm also tired of these forums. Let's get to work.
the mayor is still the mayor, so let's finish it there and then we can continue on. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates. This has been a fantastic practice of democracy, and we hope that this debate has provided our audience with a better understanding of the candidates' perspectives and their plans for the city's future. Así es, ya escucharon ustedes a los candidatos demócratas para la alcaldía de Hartford. Esperamos que esta información lo ayude a tomar una decisión sabia al momento de votar. An important reminder, the primary elections will be held on Tuesday. September 12th and the general elections on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023. Y lo más importante de esta tarde, recordar que las elecciones primarias serán el martes 12 de septiembre y las elecciones generales serán el martes 7 de noviembre. Thank you all for joining us on behalf of Women at the Table Connecticut. Have a wonderful evening. Gracias a todos que pasen unas buenas noches.